but Quentin Hardy is the deputy director um, or technology editor of the New York Times. He has covered Silicon Valley for over two decades at the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the Times, and he also taught at UC Berkeley High School for over a decade. Um, please help me welcome Quentin uh, to Onug um, and a distinguished panel as well. Hi, uh, and boy, if you thought I was Harry that day, can I get this down a little bit? It's yeah. scaring me. <laughs> okay, uh, you want to bring that down a little bit? Thank you, okay. Don't want to blow out anybody's eardrums. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if it was Harry that day, you should have seen me today. I just got back from San Francisco where I was covering, I think it's like phase 43 of the Oracle Google trial, where oh. they're arguing <laughs> about whether Java's and Android and Oracle's up to asking for $9.4 billion now, so that's fantastic. And Eric Schmidt probably could have had a better afternoon than he did. That'll go on. Never mind that. And the point of where I'm going there is like, the lawyers talked about how three billion Android phones have now been activated since 2008. The Java feature phones that were prevalent then just got wiped out and this is an open source system that's just gone mad and in less than 10 years completely dominated the system. It followed on Linux, wiping out, if you will, Sun Microsystems and many other companies with the triumph of x86 type computing. And now, what we're taking up today is the prospect of open source inside the data center and where that's going to go and how big that might be, the effect and the outlook for everybody inside that. Is there something special inside data center architectures that will prevent them from having a similar kind of experience? Or are we seeing, going to see this rolling kind of open source process take place inside the data centers themselves. Um, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, this question might have been sort of absurd. There were big clouds. AWS started 2006, um, and they were largely proprietary systems. Since then, it seemed less and less like a co comparative advantage. You've seen OpenStack come up. You've seen smaller systems come up. You've seen Facebook do a lot to grow quickly, open sourcing both hardware and software. Um, if it was unthinkable 10 years ago, it rises the prospect of being inevitable now. But these are also really big, complex systems. This isn't like doing phones or servers. So how big is the, the, the movement in the data centers? From the current status, how much can it affect? What's going to happen to big specialty players inside this system? And are there going to be new companies, perhaps even new service providers that rise up in that? What remains proprietary? What loses margin? What potentially gains margin? Are new business models being created? These aren't questions I can answer, but I've got five guys with me who probably can. Peter Christie from 451 Research, Jason Nolan from Baird, uh, Rod Hall from J.P. Morgan Chase, Peter Levine from Andreessen Horowitz and uh, Barry Eggers of Lightspeed Ventures. We're going to talk for about uh, 40 minutes and then we'll take questions for about 15, I think that's right. And um, so let me start with an open question. I'll ask you all to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do and address the question about the current state of open source in data centers, uh, how far along it's come and what has surprised you the most about it. So, Peter, why don't you open up? If I can push up. I'll push up, successfully push the button. Peter Christie, I'm a research director at 451. I've been in the business um, forever. The, one of the first machines I programmed was vacuum tube, and there ain't no one in this room that can say that, I think. Uh, we live in a, an incredible world, a rapidly changing world, and I, I like to play the the wild advocate in 451, and my, my simple advocacy is everything is going to go to AWS. This is the end of the IT ecology as we know it, the uh, apocalypse, apocalypse. It's easy for you to say. Um, but there's something remarkable going on. The, the phenomenon is you can do anything you want now without any infrastructure, and infrastructure always used to be the, the hindrance, and now it's easy to imagine almost any application that will run on these magical devices and stuff in the uh, 
um, in the cloud. The other part of, of the world that I find fascinating is the visible um, concentration into a number of small, uh, very large providers. It's an interesting topic to track because everyone doesn't want to happen, doesn't want it to happen except for for Amazon. The most interesting data, if you want to track you know, it. First off, doesn't when you have this conversation, doesn't Microsoft and Google kind of say says you and there's a place for them, or do you really think Amazon itself well, dominates all this? Microsoft started this. If you go back what ten years, it was Microsoft that was saying there's probably only need for five to ten large fabrics. Mm -hmm. So they were the early advocate, and I think in the end that's turned out to be... So the big public clouds generally is what you mean. Well, for the fabrics, people running hardware platforms, which is a really interesting and important vendor topic, because they're the people that buy operating system stacks, so there's a whole bunch of the IT ecology that, uh, that depends on it. The interesting thing about tracking um, Amazon, I, I, again, have been an irritating person inside 451 with my position and Amazon's numbers, of AWS's numbers went um, public and in the last quarter their run rate is slightly over uh, $10 billion, their growth rate is 68% year over year, nicely profitable. And the problem with if you're a Microsoft or Google and you say that, or IBM or what HP, and you say you're competing with Amazon, it's hard to do that without a a quarterly report line item that's fairly visible and and you don't find it's Microsoft makes a lot of money but it's really hard to see the part that that competes with Amazon so do, do they all agree that Amazon just walks away no but at the moment I think Amazon is the lion in the uh, in the field so I watch the Intel CPU shipment numbers which again Intel doesn't want Amazon to dominate everything so you have to deconstruct them but um, it's a pretty interesting indication of what's going on. Okay, so bring that back to open source. Open source. So the, the thing about open source, oh, yeah. open source, wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 the I mean, topic. <laughs> he was good, it was good. <laughs> so here, here's the thing, open source, and I, we've had early discussions with, with Peter, he, open source, you could never make money on the high end, because the high end people like Google or Amazon or Facebook all use open source and they do lots of engineering underneath it so they're not gonna pay you anything. You, uh, open source is great for the, the people at the bottom, the graduate students and the like who wanna build stuff and they can't afford to buy it. So there's a, another part where open source is good and if you wanted to make money in open source and Red Hat is always the canonical one, you do it in the middle of the market. Well, if everything in computing is concentrating on the top. Yes, um, there's a lot of open source being used, but no, no one is uh, getting paid for it. You know, Red Hat really troubles me that way. It's the canonical one, and it was first. Is there another one after that that's <laughs> like potentially canonical? Well, Cl Cloudera is another interesting one, although they have a very interesting cheat. They uh, are absolutely open source pure looking up at the application and then they charge people like the, the big banks in this room a lot of money for things like encryption which they view at the and side. And thus a business model is born. Yep. Jason, your thoughts? Okay. Start now. What surprised you in this build out? Uh, thank you, Jason Noland with Baird and I'll focus on uh, bifurcation and, and what I mean by that is the success that open source has had with um, elite large enterprise represented in this room um, hyperscale cloud and, and certainly uh, the carrier market um, attacking this trend, adopting it, putting it into production, and, and what you see in, in the other 99% of companies, not by um, uh, size, but by magnitude of number of companies. This is still um, scary and new. Uh, we, we just did a survey of large resellers and 75% said that they're curious but planning to wait Another 20% said they may do a pilot or some sort of POC. So there's a, there's a disconnect between what you see in mid-enterprise and most large enterprise and what you hear in this room. I'm, I'm encouraged by SD-WAN. You have something that's software-defined, it's tangible, you can put it into an existing network, see ROI, that's pretty exciting. It's a multi-billion dollar market. There's maybe going to be an IPO there, there's likely going to be M&A. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little like the Silicon Valley show right now. You've got these guys that want to build a platform, the CEO wants to build a box, and, and you need to make money, but you want to do something that's pure, 
and NSD WAN maybe is what gets us a little closer to, to software defined open source for, for most people. Does that stay its own market or does it disappear into something else? I, I think it disappears. It, it's, it's, a, it's a feature on a, on a box that is a, a god box in the branch, ultimately, I, I think. Right, right now, it's, and, but you, you got to love that. It, it's, there's a, there's a, an OPEX management so component of it. So software is eating the software. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in software-defined everything. Code is the key to the realm. And in this case, you're going to have... You're, 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 maybe, maybe the incumbent wins a big part of its, of its uh, branch router market, but maybe you have some of these smaller guys come up and make a difference. And we'll I, get to the incumbent. I, 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 I would love to see it. Um, okay, so I'm Rod Hall. A couple of thoughts I guess I've got. One is that I've been surprised at the speed with which commoditizations happen in the data center. I thought it would happen a lot quicker. It's taken a lot longer um, than I thought it would. Um, in terms of open source, I, don't, I really think the question is whether uh, the Amazon and Azure stacks end up taking over the data center completely. So I, I think that if you're a developer, I mean, I use this stuff to track social media data and stuff like that. And um, you know, if you, if you use it, you find out the interfaces are quite complex. So learning one versus another is almost learning a new coding language. And so I think that there's um, a question as to whether we really want to have Amazon Web Services and then something else running privately at a JP Morgan? Or do we want to have Amazon Web Services running at JP Morgan and external and then we just kind of seamlessly move between the two things? Um, in the former world, there's a lot of opportunity probably. I doubt if it's down at the, in, at the base hardware layer, but on up the stack, I think there'd be opportunity. I'm just not sure that that world makes sense to me because I think that um, I think the world that we're probably moving to is more like an operating system world where we have an 80-20 rule. We have 80% of the rule run by one operating system, maybe that's AWS. We have another 20 run by something else, maybe that's Azure or something else. And then on top of that is where all the value will be created. So that's kind of the, those are the questions I've got. I don't know if I've got answers okay. yet. But. Were you at reInvent in uh, October? No, I wasn't there. Because, you know, Werner Vogels gets up and he releases this 80-page white paper and he says, this is how you will write software in the future. It's basically like, how do you write to AWS? Well, you hear about that. Do you feel good about that? Does that feel open or does that feel like there's a new controlling Borg in town? So I, I happen to cover Apple as well. Yeah. And that question was asked a lot when Apple came out with their, their app store. It turns out developers don't care. They just want to make money. And if there's a ubiquitous system that they can easily write code for, they'll leverage that system. But it you know, was going to be like Woodstock. What's that? It was going to be like Woodstock. Everything was going to be free. I Guess don't know. Not, I, was, right? I wasn't around for that. So I, I can't <laughs> well, what's surpri you said you're surprised how long the commoditization has taken. Why is that surprising to you? I thought that, um, I guess I thought that it, it made a lot of economic sense to me that, um, you know, that people would leverage commodities hardware, particularly the data center where the, the silicon is commoditized. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of inertia there and it's taking a lot longer for that to play out mm -hmm. than I originally thought it would three, four years ago. So. Peter, are you surprised? Is this taking a long time? I, I think, uh, so I'm Peter Levine, a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. I sit on a number of boards, open source and non-open source. I ran an open source company at one point in time, Zen Source, so I have uh, a lot of battle scars in actually making that all work. So I have a lot of opinions about open source. Has it taken a long time? Um, you know, I think what happens is the mid-market where somebody said the mid-market hasn't moved or whatever. Mid-market is completely leapfrogging. There won't be a data center in mid-market. The mid-market moves to Microsoft 360, Google Docs, whatever. I mean, how many of us here, I don't know who's out here, but like you go on your mobile phone and you look up something in the cloud or- Wow, no or wonder you're, you're not taking Michael Dell's calls. Yeah, I haven't in a, in a while. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but what we are seeing is at the higher end, you know, this whole commoditization of the data center at a certain scale. Here's what's very interesting to me. About 15 years ago, if we were sitting in this room, if this room were here, all of the data center companies that wanted to build data centers would look at Wall Street and say, ooh, I want a data center that looks like Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, whatever, and it would be Sun, Oracle, EMC, kind of that old stack, right? Cisco. Um, 
And uh, today, what everyone looks at is, how do I go build a data center that looks like Facebook or Google? To some extent, Amazon. And so we are seeing the bifurcation that I see is one mid-market goes to the cloud, but open source does have a huge impact in hyperscale data centers that we are seeing the commoditization of hardware. <coughs> All the relevant components sort of move to software. I have this belief that over time the mobile supply chain eats the data center, meaning that if anybody, once again history, if anybody remembers the IBM PC in 1980 with two little floppy disk drives, if anybody said at that point in time that that architecture would be the basis of all data centers in the future, <laughs> everyone would think you were crazy. And so if you think about the mobile phone, which is now more powerful than most PCs, that architecture very likely could be the generation that transforms, you know, we're talking about smaller components, smaller pieces, I mean, this whole movement to microservices and scale out. And on the back of that is a lot of open source. And so I am a huge believer in the innovation that open source has brought to the overall market. Big believer in that. Where I struggle with is the business model of open source. And so we can talk a bunch about that. That was I don't, canonical I issue. Don't, I don't think, I wrote a blog several years ago about how there won't be another Red Hat. Um, I think that this whole notion of support for open source is a broken model and doesn't allow enough innovation inside the company to actually do great things. We can talk more about that. But um, So separating whether I believe in open source versus the open source business model, the open source business model is where innovation needs to occur and let open source flourish, and I have sort of That's a flawless segue to Barry, because you sent me an email saying we need to explore flavors of business models. Oh, there you go. How many can wow. there be? <laughs> wow, I didn't there even know that. Of them. Uh, <laughs> I'm Barry Eggers, I'm a founding partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners. Uh, there's not many answers left on your question. <laughs> the hell. I tend to agree with a lot of the things that were said, though. Uh, first of all, I, was, I joined Cisco in 1991, and I remember uh, the days when IGRP was sort of a core part of their strategy. People remember that was proprietary. It's 25 years later. I don't think a lot has changed. I mean, we have more commoditization because of the hardware side, but I don't think we have as much commoditization on the software side, which is what this group's all about, right? And so you look at it, I tend to look at the stack because I grew up at Cisco, so I tend to look at the stack as a, as a way of analyzing it. I think there's more opportunity uh, to dis for software to displace hardware, proprietary hardware, in the higher levels of the stack than the lower levels of the stack. The problem is I think there's more activity with, uh, with open source and commoditization of software on the lower levels of the stack. So the question is, have we got it backwards? Are we starting in the wrong place? You know, are we sort of you know, taking our, our, our pick and hitting against a stone that we shouldn't be doing? I don't know. But frankly, it needs to happen faster uh, for innovation, for new companies to come along and make, make this market better for us and, 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 and create a better user experience, frankly, for all the new technologies like containers and stuff that we want to deploy. I'm kind of surprised. That's three of you leaning towards this is really taking a long time, this is kind of slow. And to me, it's remarkably fast. Are you just like impatient VCs? Or yeah, just well, let's say we got 10 years <laughs> left on our VC career. We better have right. it in 10 yeah. years, for God's right. sake. Just I have two more funds to go. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, is it really, what, what do you think has slowed it, 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 if it has been slowed? Well, I was at a dinner in LA last week with a bunch of uh, users, customers, uh, CIOs and IT folks, and we started talking about their network and that was the one area where they said, it's my network. Don't touch it. It works. I get fired if my network breaks. You want to talk about the other stuff? We can talk about the other stuff. Now, I think a lot of people are more progressive than that, but that is a common view from a lot of users. And I think at some point, we have to break through that. The question is, how do we break through it? Where does it start? Well, I, sorry, I think one of the places, you know, one of the, one of the things that has, in my mind, moved very quickly is what I call the rise of the developer. When you think about the developer, software developers. I used to be a software developer. When I was a developer, I couldn't buy a pencil. Like I had no budget. Whatever was on my desk would be handed to me by some god somewhere, and I would program, and that's what I did. 
Today, the developer is the new buying power inside a company. And I believe that this developer ecosystem, and this really happened over the past five years, is the, is the tail wagging the dog on much of this sort of application movement, much of the hyperscale. That's how we're gonna see this new sort of evolution of um, new applications and new innovation is going to occur on the back of the developer. Every developer and every one of your, organ I mean many of you probably are developers, and many of you run organizations, I can tell you that developers have the most modern tools, they have the best insights, and they're you know, programming very far ahead of where the rest of the company's at. And so I think that's, to me, one of the leading indicators of sort of the new trend in the enterprise is the rise of the developer. Mm -hmm. I, I might add to that, because I, I, I agree with that. That's why I think it's important to think about these stacks more as operating systems on, on top of which developers are gonna operate, right, right. as opposed to, you know, because I, I think the world is going to be driven more by these people and much less by the network engineer, the right. storage engineer, all these kinds of people. I, I, so I agree with that. I think, and I think it, you know, we're thinking about investments aimed at that direction more than more than investments aimed at the old hardware. I thought it was. I wanted to ask you quite. It, I thought it was interesting. You said we should have started up Stack, and I was curious if you could expand on that a little bit. Like, why why do you think it makes more sense to go up Stack with with um, open source instead of down stack? Um, I think Cisco is probably weakest at the top of the stack, strongest at the bottom of the stack, and, and they are- What areas in particular would you They are the prevalent, you know, security, uh, ADC, load balancing, um, different application oriented services. You know, they've tried, and they haven't been as success successful in those areas, and we see companies like Palo Alto come along and do pretty well in those mm -hmm. areas, with proprietary platforms, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think over time, that's a better place, better, better hunting ground for, for uh, you know, for startups. I, a lot, a number of startups have tried to attack Cisco at layer two and three. Um, certainly, Nicera was successful. That's a different story, though. When you go after them as from a system standpoint, you can ask Jay Shree. It's pretty hard. She's been successful at it, but it's pretty hard. Yeah, and they <coughs> so continue, they continue to fight at that front. Do you get any sense Cisco is? going to change its approach a little bit. I get the sense, sorry, go ahead. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Cisco has changed. I mean, that's, I, and it also ended up, I'm a radical with AWS and the Cisco Defender, and go figure how you put that together. That's but a little the, incoherent. No, the, the part that people missed in the early SDN arguments was they, because Cisco was painted as a, an awful, lethargic, um, innovation-suppressing dinosaur, and I think the point that was missed for the vast majority of the networking market is this. The network has two qualities. It's business critical and non-differentiating. So if you're a, a, a small to mid business, the only thing you can do by experimenting with your network is shoot yourself in the foot. It's unlikely you can build a better network and if you go to a, let's say a DevOps network, which I think it sounds ridiculous now, but was a concept of the early SDN, and, and all of a sudden your Java programmer leaves and your network stops running reliably, it just doesn't tie out. So what people missed was that the product Cisco sold to the vast majority of the market, not to the high end, not to the, the mega scale providers, was a service offering called a working network. And, and that's what people wanted. And if you wanted to compete with Cisco, what you had to do was offer a comparable working network. And obviously that needed some parsing in the marketplace. And you then had to offer it at a considerably cheaper price than Cisco did because they were the incumbent. And the problem is that has nothing to do with the hardware or the fact that your packet forwarding chips are better or anything. It's a service oriented product and that's what Cisco has always done really well. And as part of that, if you look at what they've done over the, the last few five years, they have patiently modernized their product offerings. And there's still, if you look at iWAN or the like, it's pretty clunky by the standards of the leading edge SD-WAN, but it provides a pretty good solution. So is your choice between a pretty good solution from the largest and, and I think best tech partner in the world or do you want to go to, a, to a, 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 a startup in order to try and get something better? Well, actually when Barry was saying, you know, the, the guys say don't touch my network, they're really talking about fault tolerance, quality of service, SLAs, all that stuff. Um, is that a defensible position or does open source get better so that it can match that level of fault tolerance. 
Uh, it's just to continue the conversation, and, and we, we hear this all the time from the channel. CCXX is the channel. You just can't underestimate the power of that. And, and that's Cisco. As long as the market changes slowly, they can adjust to those changes. If it was to change in one or two years, it would have been a lot different uh, story here today. But um, in, in the work that we've done, you hear a very, very different discussion on server and storage and, and what the public cloud is doing to server and storage and the level of innovation in the storage market and the, you know, maybe not destruction, but the, the challenges you've seen for some of the storage incumbents versus what we've seen in network and security. And it's not quite the topic of this conversation, but I think it's germane that Facebook is now releasing networking switches and telco switches and wireless stuff. They're going to move into this area and spend a lot of money working it. And, and that's maybe that's the end result of all this. You know, beyond our careers, there's one giant data data center sitting on every continent that we that serves as a public utility. I and, feel fine. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, for me, I um. You know, I kind of, I think about this slightly differently in that, um, first of all, open source has the opportunity to, one, it may change up networking, but certainly around the periphery, it absolutely can change many networking components. Um, for example, active, you know, active directory, maybe that's not quite a networking component, but it's an access control mechanism. What I view is that instead of open source living on-prem and following the Red Hat model, if we're going to talk about open source models, open source as a service is a wonderful business model. So take, for example, a company like Okta that builds a Active Directory as a service or a company like Databricks that builds a um, you know, database in the cloud or Zscaler that has WAN optimization in the cloud, right? If you think about those types of servers or GitHub that's development in the cloud. How many of these are AH investments? Some of them, not all, <laughs> not all, not all. Um, you know, my view is that a lot of the infrastructure components get relegated out to the cloud as services. And here's where microservices come in um, to where we can, I can envision many open source projects not being on-prem but having an API set where you can get access to all different kinds of services that have been available on-prem, now they're, they're available off-prem through a vendor that's supporting and managing that particular part of the network, whether it's the main backbone to the network. I see a lot of ancillary components, same with security, storage, compute, like a lot of these pieces will get relegated out to these open source as a service model and uh, I think that that works quite well. I, w I want to just comment on this idea of um, chipping away at Cisco being difficult. I think it's true in a static world. I think that the world we're living in is a little bit different in the sense that if you look at the economics of AWS, you know, they started to release the amortized cost that they have for networking. It's about 7% of their amortized cost. But if you look at typical enterprise IT, it's 25%, something like that. And so, and, and if you look at the, if you look at the amount of, um, you know, workloads that are running in AWS, now nobody knows exactly, but people estimate 15, 20% of enterprise workloads, um, you know, but they're, the, the amount of money that they're spending globally is about five to 7% of total data center investment. So if you, if you look at TCO, so, there's a real compression of cost that has to happen for an enterprise to catch up with Amazon's underlying cost to provide that service. I think that's the problem that Cisco and people like that have is if you're an enterprise, you'd be happy to go with Cisco, but you're not gonna be happy to do it at the cost that you do today. You're gonna have to, that cost structure is gonna have to change and evolve toward AWS, I think. Yeah, um, Intel so. too, it just you know, in their last earnings, Intel is saying, we're gonna become a cloud-centric company. Well, your margins just went through some heavy, heavy changes in your customer base just shifted radically. Look, I, you know, I, I'm, along these lines of, you know, Cisco, whether Cisco is vulnerable or not, a couple of years ago we could sit here and say, well, the storage industry is not vulnerable. Look what's happened to storage. Why can't that happen to networking? The same thing, right? It's the economics of the cloud economic model and the commodity, commodity components, whether it's open source or commodity hardware, absolutely can start to 
eat into these particular environments. And if anybody says store, you know, storage is as important as a network, your data fails, like it's, you know, that's part of the ecosystem that's, that's critical to a data center. So um, I am a believer that we can disrupt the networking industry through open source and commodity components. We are an investor in Cumulus Networks, and so like I'm very bullish on the prospects of that particular type of approach. So there's a dramatic change also going on in networking, which I don't think is as visible as the public cloud change, and that's, it's been mentioned uh, today several times, and that's, I think it was the guy at GE was talking about how he could imagine his network toggling because increasingly the workloads are in the cloud and at some magic moment your network has to be in the cloud. Well, if you think of an enterprise worker on their mobile phone using an application that's running out of a, a cloud provider, um, there is no corporate network and yet all of the functions that the corporate network does other than connectivity, um, compliance, authentication, performance management have to be provided. So those are gonna go pretty quickly and, and perhaps abruptly into cloud-based services. Right, I agree with that. And, I, and I if that, that happens, then <laughs> yes. the interesting question is, I mean, what Cisco understands that. Cisco is patiently lumbering along doing that. They have a lot of cloud resources for security. Will Cisco be able to parlay their, we, all we do is deliver a working network in, into that service. They, have, they know how to do it. The other part that people miss on networking is that the vast majority of networking is not taught in school. So it's different than doing Linux where everyone sort of knows what Unix does. The, the people like Facebook have done very well or Cumulus using very limited networking uh, capabilities. So if you're inside the data center mm -hmm. yeah. and everything is L3 routing and you're doing ECMP for load spreading and BGP, all of that is available in pretty robust open source software. If you're doing anything that looks like a conventional corporate network where there's 20 protocols, no one knows how to implement those protocols except for a handful of network vendors, God forbid, how you make them work all together compatibly in one, in one stack. So the interesting question to me is, how rapidly does the Baroque nature of enterprise networking disappear? It has to move to the cloud. If it moves in its fullness today, Cisco and, and the other big vendors that are knowledgeable will be in a strong position if it gets simplified in the style of Cumulus or, or what Facebook did in Altoona or what Google does, then it will be a whole different picture. Now, um, a minute ago or earlier on, <coughs> Peter said, you know, we used to look at this stack where it was Sun and Oracle and EMC and Microsoft. Two of those companies are kind of gone. Um, <laughs> and yeah. are there incumbents you like in this deal? Are there big incumbents? anybody can cheer on. Are there new incumbents that look more durable? Yeah, I mean, I like Intel. I mean, as everything moves to commodity, guess who wins? Intel. If software eats the world, it doesn't need Intel. But then you get Because it runs on Intel. Yeah. It might run on right. ARM, though. It might, but it hasn't saying, so like, far. Right, it hasn't right? so far. Yeah. yeah. So, Intel's... Intel goes through there. some changes, but Intel endures. I, I mean, think so. Intel did announce 12,000 layoffs two weeks ago, so... Not yeah, great. I understand. I'm just, you're asking yeah, me long right. term. Long term, they're embedded. I think, um, you know, of the, of the list that, well, I didn't say Microsoft, but Microsoft is doing a nice job in transforming their business. Yeah. Um, really, I mean, a lot of their energy is, is going towards Azure, and they are making a lot of efforts to, you know, become a cloud compute vendor, and mm. I think that's rather interesting. I've seen a big change at Microsoft, so. I also think at the end of the day that Cisco's still gonna be there as a winner. I, yeah. just, I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. You just don't displace someone like Cisco. So people I, uh, might take some of their business from them. They'll, th they'll figure out, they'll buy companies, they'll figure out how to retain their leadership, though. Yeah, I don't right. think they'd go away. I mean, they, 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 if nothing else, they're in the telecom networks, which would be really hard to commoditize, I think. And what's interesting, I was going to say, we, um, we did a CIO survey that we published a couple weeks ago now, and in that, Microsoft by far the leading uh, vote getter for future critical vendors. But guess who's number two now? Amazon Web Services. Really? And then, and then Cisco is next, which we were shocked to see, because I thought you'd see Amazon coming from behind, catching up, but they've actually surpassed Cisco now. If you consider how difficult the time AWS has had learning how to talk to big companies effectively, that's so impressive that they got that kind of ground going. I'd like, I'd like, just, I'd like to ask a question 
on the other side as a moderator here. Uh -oh. I'll be the moderator on the left, <laughs> actually the right for these folks. Um, I want to ask these guys, so the, the, the opposite of what you just asked, who are the two or three companies most at risk here? Who's most at risk? Yeah. Incumbents. Well, I was just at the, uh, the last EMC yeah, uh, meeting, which was really interesting, wonderful, high-touch, one of the best meetings I've ever gone to. But, um, and you, when you listen to what their strategy is, I can't argue against it. They sort of want to be the, and, and uh, this sounds too derogatory, but they want to be the equivalent of the last punch card <coughs> vendor for, for legacy IT. And they think if they <laughs> assemble these, these resources, they can do that in their ideas. You, you sort of do that, you, 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 you blow HP into smithereens, and, and you end up getting lots of money, the last money while people convert to the cloud. But then you How's ask- How's that not like one of those weird computer associate roll-up models? It, it is, so they oh. say, and then there's, on the other side of the it mirror, <laughs> they become a cloud vendor. So that means that we have to do this, we're on the wrong side of the transition, we have to change, we have this transition plan that plausibly is workable. But then you say, I, th I think what you are on the other side of the mirror is a software and services vendor. I mean, you're not gonna be, unless you buy Acton and the like, you're not gonna be selling hardware to the mega scale cloud providers. So what's your role? You say, EM, Dell Technologies is a large software and systems vendor. Well, it's, it's not impossible, but it certainly doesn't build on any of their strengths. So we just asked this similar question of the channel um, of the legacy vendors who's best positioned for the future. Number one was Microsoft, and, and number two, to my, my surprise, was Cisco. At the, at the bottom of the list, to answer your question, uh, was uh, uh, NetApp and uh, Brocade. Um, <laughs> no, and, uh, and, and yeah, and HPE was <laughs> HPE was somewhere in the middle. I mean, just given the scale of the company, there's there's certainly parts of the business that are doing better than others. But oh, and if you looked at the scale of answers and ours, uh, Microsoft was like three times the response of AWS. AWS and Cisco were almost even. AWS just a little bit above Cisco, and everything else was nowhere. So it you know, drops right off. after those three, there's almost no response for the rest of them. Well, wow, that's such an interesting description or, or suggestion of what the mental state is like inside the CIO offices now. I don't like, I don't really know who to trust or where to go, you know, and, and I'm looking for a new model. Or even if I'm, I'm relevant at some point in the future. Well, I've got to, well, they all know they have to, you know, create developer-centric CIO offices. Many of them are having a hard time getting there, it seems like. Yeah, it seems to me that Storage and compute, any, any companies in those categories are most uh, are subject to the whole commoditization uh, wave that's happening right now. Um, so I would put those, you know, just generally in categories. Um, you know, the question, Quentin, that you asked is what have the new companies kind of become the next incumbents? And something, I think that's, something like a standard, yeah. You know, something. Um, <clears throat> Because we've already seen, you know, Facebook and Google and Amazon. I mean, those are sort of the new incumbents. So what's next, right? And I'm again. I'll go back to the rise of the developer. Those companies. I mean, in, in startup land, the companies that are going after the rise of the developer have, in my mind, a very strategic position in the enterprise that's different from many other many other avenues in, because it's a new buying center as I mentioned and so I am uh, we and I are very bullish around companies you know github might be a good example of that I'm on the board of github for the record but um, you know I'm very bullish on that particular type of company um, growing up to be a standalone new type of company that's really going after the developer ecosystem. So now, I'm gonna reassert my moderator side here. Yeah. Barry, just because you asked the mean question, that doesn't mean you're exempt from answering it. Uh. Who, do you, who do you think is weak? Yeah, I agree with storage. It got dis, you know, disrupted by Flash, and I think the companies that didn't prepare for Flash uh, get left behind. Um, on the networking side, you know, I think that companies that traditionally have delivered their functionality in a monolithic system are gonna have problems over time, especially as we see more east-west traffic, more microservices, more container deployments. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that they can move fast enough or will move fast enough if they're drunk on high margins. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I think Cisco's in, in uh, denial a little bit, you know, and I, and I think that 
they are drunk on high margin, so the switching part of their business is highly at risk. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff they do that probably isn't. Well, but. drunk on high margins is one way to put it. The other way is like the minute they admit what time it is and their margins are going to have to shrink, everybody in your business puts a sell sign on them and their stock goes to hell. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very uh, hard line to walk. You know, I've, I've been inside of large companies, been on all sides of this, running small companies inside of large companies and I actually ran M&A for a large, fairly large public company. And the challenge is with large companies, it's not that no one sees these trends coming. Everyone is smart inside these large companies. No question of they see it. The problem is, is that the, 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 the finance group or the business itself says, look, unless this can be a billion dollar business, we shouldn't even look at it. Because to move the needle inside a large company, a very large company like a Cisco, a hundred million dollar business, it doesn't matter. But a hundred million dollar business to a startup is a huge business. And so that's where the mm. dilemma comes in in terms of, you know, it's the, it's the innovator's dilemma with respect to how you can actually prosecute M&A in an effective fashion. And so, you know, for, there's no question that the balance sheets and all the bits and pieces, everything, you can go buy into all of these movements, but the margin pressure and this whole notion of like, we got to go have a billion dollar business like in a year from now, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And that precludes doing a lot of interesting things in favor of continuing the cash cow, having been on that side. And there, so, I mean, you know, I used to work for AT&T, yeah, same kind like, of thing. Right? They, you know, you have all the political powers with the guys that control the P&L. Yeah. And so those guys, there's always smart people and they all know all the stuff that's going on and they all have all the ideas, but they never get, those ideas never bubble up and get funding because the guy controls well, the it, P&L's and political it, powers it, linked to the P&L. And typically those things are the things that are going to be dilutive, not accretive, right? right? And so like there's all these financial sort of machinations that, that hamper a lot. Yeah, I, was I, actually, I got two more places I want to go, but yeah. Yeah, I was talk actually, in a sec, Barry. First, okay. we, we got about 10 minutes left. We will take questions. Prepare them in your heads if you have Talk, Barry. I, I was the first acquisition guy at Cisco, and I think you go back to Cisco and you say they've done an Cisco actual, did acquisitions? They, yeah, like two or three yeah. hundred. Um, and, and actually, the most successful ones were small companies. Crescendo. Small companies that came in. Crescendo, Crescendo was the best acquisition ever paid years. for all the others yeah. after it. Yeah. So I do think that the companies that are really good at acquiring, I think Cisco is very open minded yeah. about That's acquisition. I, don't, I think that will help them. Yeah. The companies that are not good at acquiring or haven't been able to integrate those acquisitions well will, will have trouble in this market and this trend. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Just want to say? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, again, numbers, I tend to think in a, at least reason, <coughs> a quantitative way, that, that the number that's causing um, Intel and HP and Dell heartache now is the relatively rapid decline, the accelerating decline of the PC. And if you're in Intel, and all of a sudden the PC business goes away more rapidly than you expected, it's just horrifying. I think that's the 12,000 layoffs. W what do you do? It's hard to adjust. It the, is PC guys, yeah. But the, the other the same is showing up in servers. If you deconstruct the Intel numbers, they don't really want you to see them. Intel talks about a data center business growing at 6% a year, the public cloud growing at 25% a year, and the, the cloud and the enterprise businesses being roughly the same with um, a crossover this year. And when I do the arithmetic, it seems to suggest that in the purest way that the legacy IT business selling servers into traditional enterprise channels is on a decline that's prob probably worse than the PC decline. It is not lost to me that the most vigorous arguments I get about hot, the future of hybrid cloud come from companies interested in selling servers. So, right, and that's not happening because what Intel does is is categorize um, cloud as running a data center for profit, whereas enterprise is running a data center for the service of the, of the enterprise. So a pure um, private cloud is enterprise and Intel's notion. And boy, if, that num if that's the best estimate of what's happening in legacy IT, then all the people in it, the Dell Technologies and, and HP and the like are in a huge amount of pain. I don't know how you, if that starts going down more rapidly, I really don't know how you, you uh, adopt to it ec economically. Uh, speaking of that, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, they, those companies you mentioned that are troubled are the biggest employers left in the valley. And that's going to be a little freaky. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> So Google's doing a lot of cool stuff in the cloud offering new services. Do you think they can 
do you, do you think they can take market share away from AWS? And another question is, out of all the companies you mentioned, you didn't mention Apple, and could that be because they're not a networking company? Well, I, I'll start. I mean, I think it's hard to, um, these, think of it in turn, I always think, go back to the operating system, maybe it's a bad analogy, but it, you, operating systems get leveraged and, and they, they end up market share splitting 80-20 because developers vote one way or the other. That's why Apple's ecosystem is dominant and Android's never really you know, managed to make that much headway against it, especially from a profit point of view. So I feel like it's gonna be very tough to catch up to Amazon at this stage because all the developers are there. But Google's also a very strange company. Historically, one of the most remarkable one-trick ponies, and I, I dealt with them five years ago when they were trying to go into enterprise search, and it was it's just sad. They, 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 the way they nurture people, they have no understanding of the life in the enterprise. Can Diane Green turn them around and, and, and teach them what, it, what it's like to sell the enterprise while it's still relevant? Possible, it seems like a really big task for her. They will have to partner. Yes? Will there be another VMware size company? Or are we basically going to have a whole bunch of like software based infrastructure companies that maybe half the size of that five or something like that? I mean, I think there'll be, I'm very bullish on there being a number of companies that could be VMware size. I think they're going to be offering their uh, products as a service, not on prem. The question is, is VMware the last proprietary uh, infrastructure company? Quite possibly. Um, I think open source is eating, you know, kind of the entire infrastructure space. But as a service, I do believe there will be a number of very interesting companies that get built out of this hyperscale transition microservice trend. So hope is not, you know, I'm very hopeful for the future here, including all the jobs. I mean, remember, Quentin, when you comment on, you know, the biggest employers losing, you know, 10 years ago, there was no Google, big jobs. Apple was much smaller. Facebook wasn't in existence. So, you know, there well, are they, companies they, they, that they do. Go somewhere. I didn't say they, tech was dead. It's, you know, it's going to be traumatic. You know, they, it's the, be huge uh, the, you know, the market transitions itself, and Silicon Valley has this wonderful capacity to continually uh, reinvent itself. Destruction. Yeah. Um, well, that's what happens. But it's, it, it's interesting where that's concerned because you mentioned VMware sized companies and you were talking about this kind of um, phone model that might occur. You know, for years when we talked about networking, for the last 20 years, we talked, 25, we talked sort of that edge core dynamic, right? Cisco got huge making edge devices that were powerful and that challenged the core routers and they got a better core router and that allowed you to do more at the edge and they had to sort of back and forth. and. You know, it may be that VMware and cloud created this new core, but that's not to say that the edge wouldn't come back in some new model with blade storage or, you know, really good ARM chips, and that could be a whole yeah, I mean, new there, avenue. We talked about this right before. I mean, I have this belief that we're going to see disaggregated cloud computing. For those of you who are around in the world of distributed computing, we are headed back towards that world. Well, network Guaranteed. robots and autonomous and cars do yeah, indicate you know, a lot of remote an computing. An autonomous you run car. run that out of a cloud. Yeah, an autonomous car is a rolling data center, mm -hmm. and there will be millions of them. So there you, you go. Know, edge, edge core has been a model that's been around for 30 years. It's not as relevant when the traffic shifts from north south to east west, though. Um, and I think the you know, to answer your question on, on is there a next VMware, I think the world of containers gives us the next VMware. I'm not sure who it's going to be. You guys have bets, we have bets, there's lots of bets out there, but this is an important um, sort of movement. And it's starting from DevOps, by the way, it's starting from the people yeah. that are, and, and I think it's gonna change the way networks are built and architected. It's gonna be an impetus to displace some of these monolithic vendors over time. I have three different times, go ahead. It's like Palo Alto Networks in not this market, but an adjacency coming from nowhere to take share from Cisco and Checkpoint with the platform and as, as the subscription modules that they've added and now the endpoint market, that's a wonderful story and, and likely as big or bigger than VMware someday. I have three different clocks with three different times, so I either have one or two more questions. <laughs> yes, sir. You? Yeah. Okay. So I got a question about the act of creating um, open source software. So 
It's a bad analogy, but if you go to an OpenStack conference, it's kind of like Occupy Wall Street, right? It's kind of chaotic. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, you've got a few companies like Red Hat and maybe um, um, you know, Cloudera. The business model issue. Right. So do you think it's too chaotic to have um, uh, a lot of innovation that really uh, addresses the needs of uh, end users, or is it just the way things are? Chaos leads to a lot of innovation. You know, open source is like Baskin Robbins. There's 31 flavors. Um, Red Hat is the pure flavor. A Cloud Era is not a pure open source model. Um, it's a good model, by the way. I think it's a better model because they've taken an open core and they've put proprietary elements around it they can actually charge for and run a real business. So one, to Peter's point. One of, um, one of my uh, investment uh, beliefs when investing in open source, which we do, and I'm a big believer in open source, and this may relate to how you buy open source, is for the most part we only invest in companies where the inventors of the open source project are part of that company. And that keeps the continuity of that roadmap intact. There's a thing called a fork that happens when some other company takes the base code and then goes and runs with it in a different direction. Again, I find that the purity of a project is mostly controlled, best controlled, by the inventors of that technology. So that keeps, to me, that's one of the mitigators against complete chaos. OpenStack is a great example of complete chaos because there is not one company where there is the core developers of the entire project that work on that thing. It's, you know, in my mind, OpenStack is kind of a hairball of... It's like, know, the, it's it's like the at home problem. Too yeah, many big companies at the top. Many, everyone's got their hands in that cookie jar creating a variety of different implementations and that's problematic for it. I, I would say the other thing about open source economies, if you use the, if you use this, the, the chunks of code, you're, it's a barter system. So you, you contribute a little chunk of code and somebody else contributes more chunks of code back to you, and so you don't have to really write software now. You just grab in different chunks of stuff off GitHub and slap it together. I mean, otherwise we equity analysts wouldn't be able to consume social media data. You know, so <laughs> it, it, I think there's a barter system, and then there's, there, you know, out of that there can be projects that emerge and grow into real companies. If you haven't read it, um, S Stephen Levy wrote a book. Tw this is more than 25 years, because they had the 25th year anniversary of hackers, and it's about the origins of so much of the open source concept, uh, the MIT Model Railroad Club. But it's an amazing piece of history because you see the beginning of the, the dynamic of should software be, should be free. It's a really good read. So I, I can take one more. I'll take it off this side if anybody had questions because I keep looking this <coughs> way. Right. You win by default. Right. So one quick comment, maybe it was mentioned. Atlassian is a company that is That's a great company. very promising in the open source yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it's a great point. That last one's a great company. IBM. <coughs> What's the yeah, emoticon never. for IBM? <laughs> <laughs> it's that emoticon where the mouth is what, flat. What did they, what did they do? <laughs> yeah. I can't get I can't get this dinner out of my head where the our IT guys were asked, "What's the number one vendor that you do business today with today, but you'll do no business with or very little in five years?" And IBM was number one. So. Oh. I, I don't. I don't happy have now? a real good feeling. Yeah, I'm IBM. Gonna... I'll give the squishing answer that most of you have given. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> IBM does something important that a lot of these cloud guys don't do well, which is talk to business people. Yeah. And that actually may be what they end up doing on behalf of cloud companies. Yeah. Don't we have bots for that? <laughs> oh yeah, that works. It's called Watson. Yeah. I was gonna say, I mean, IBM, the, the problem I see is that uh, the CEO has, has missed quarterly estimates for seven straight quarters, so at some point- You got an issue. No, at some point they got to turn, they have to show they can stabilize their business. I actually think the most important thing they could do is get out of the, the cloud um, hosting business. They have lots of interesting software. There's no reason they should run it on their own hardware. If they can't do that, then I, I think that their history will probably drag them down so into the muck. Software was like a $2 billion oops. Yeah. Mm, that's so How much was Zensource? It was an IBM. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, on that note. <laughs> Uh, please give them a hand. Sure, we'll right along. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>